Well, we didn't get Kyle Bowen, but we got a lot of other really good prospects. And uh, what exactly does the volume of recruits say about Oregon's roster right now? Here we go. You are Locked On Ducks, your daily podcast on the Oregon Ducks, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Yes, it is that time once again for Locked On Ducks. I'm your host, Spencer McLaughlin. Thank you so much for making this your first listen or your first view of the day. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your number one source to stay up to date with the Ducks. Like, comment, subscribe, please, and thank you wherever you listen to or watch this show, which today is brought to you by Bet Online. Bet Online has you covered this season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before. Bet Online is where the game starts. So that was like the wildest recruitment ever. <laughs> I mean, I mean, like signing day as a whole was pretty nuts. But Peyton Bowen, I apologize for calling him Kyle Bowen yesterday on the show. He plays basketball for St. Mary's at the mid-major level school. I followed for a long time. I had a friend who played there. Yada yada yada. Anyway, so Peyton Bowen is not coming to Oregon, but there's still a lot of really good news. He's going to Oklahoma. For those of you who don't know this story. I'll give you a brief recap. He was a verbal commitment to Notre Dame. On National Signing Day, he puts the Notre Dame hat on his head, takes it off, puts on the Oregon hat, puts up the O and says, go Ducks, then never signs his national letter of intent. And for reasons we can only speculate about, so I won't get into them, he's now going to Oklahoma. I don't know. Never seen anything like that before. Still, this is a very good Oregon recruiting class. And it won't be finalized until February. There are still more players to add. This is just the first signing window. But I think where this class is at in terms of the number of players they're adding, both in the high school ranks and in the transfer portal, says something about where Dan Lanning, Tosh Lupoy, now Will Stein, and the rest of the staff see the roster. As of right now, as I'm recording this on December 22nd, there are going to be 27 new players on Oregon's team next year from the high school and transfer ranks. 27 after a year that saw Oregon fall to a disappointing 9-3 and three and was one bad quarter of football away or one play away in a couple games from getting back to the Pac-12 championship game. And yet, there are going to be a lot of new bodies, a lot of new faces. How many will see the field? We'll continue to evaluate that over the offseason, read practice reports, watch the spring game, and monitor because some will certainly play more than others. But that's a lot. That's a lot of names. And again, there could still be more. Guys like Roderick Pleasant, who was on a visit to Oregon. Ducks appear to be in a good spot for. He could still come to the Ducks. There's still an entire other... Signing day, I think of the top 100 players in the country, like 80% of them or so have already signed or at least verbally committed. So this is becoming more and more the bigger of the two signing days, but there's still another one where guys will commit and you can get players pretty late in the cycle. Remember, it was even after National Signing Day last year that Josh Connerly committed. And he's a guy who played this year meaningful snaps. So there's still a lot of ways, a long ways to go. It looks like right now about 15 of the high school commits that the Ducks have will be enrolling early, meaning they'll be around for spring football. But one thing that I'm seeing going forward is there are just continuing to be fewer and fewer and fewer players from the 2020 and 2021 classes. So what that tells me that Dan Lanning, Tosh Lupoy, and Will Stein, and Don Johnson, the director of player personnel, Marshall Malkow, the, the chief of staff, what, what they're all seeing is, yeah, the roster had a lot of good players that they won nine games with this year. But they think that there are a lot of changes that need to be made because this is a huge, I'm, I mean a huge volume of players. And just off the top of my head, you're looking at the two transfer offensive linemen will probably be starters. Treshawn Holden, that's a starter. 
Justin Jacobs going to be a starter, especially now that Noah Sewell is going to the NFL. He made that official. I will pay proper homage to him at, at another time because he deserves it and was a great Oregon Duck who I will be excited to watch on Sundays. Hopefully he and his brother get to go up against one another. Maybe maybe Panay will block Noah at some point in time. That'd be fun to watch. Or maybe Noah would get around Panay's block. I don't know. I think I'd pick Panay in that one, but it's, it's tough. They're both really, really good, as we know. Anyway, there are so many players. With Jacobs, you, you put Kyrie Jackson into the fold. And it's not like Oregon's done in the transfer portal. Rem- portal. Remember, National Signing Day is coming past, but the portal's still open till the 18th of January. And by the way, Oregon has another game to play in 2022. Got the Holiday Bowl against North Carolina. Chance to get to 10 wins. Chance for a lot of guys to see the field because Noah Sewell's not there, so is it going to be the Keith Brown show? Chris, Christian Gonzalez isn't there. Still haven't heard on Brandon Dorless. Just saying, still have not heard. I, I I didn't think it would take this long for Sewell to announce, but I didn't think it would take this long for Dorless to to announce, and Dorless has not yet. I don't want you to get your hopes up. I'm just saying, it's taking a little longer than you think. So I wonder what will happen there, though I do suspect Dorless will, will end up going to the NFL. But you'll have a lot of opportunities for playing time. And so if guys who are on the roster right now look at the players that are coming in and maybe how much they play in that bowl game and say, this might not be where I'm going to be able to maximize my potential as a player or maximize my playing time, then they could continue to enter the portal. And Oregon will open up roster slots as a result and be able to bring players in if that's what they think they want to do. But the the message here from Lanning and the staff is, is pretty clear. And that's that they don't just want to have their own players in there. They feel like there were, you know, I, I'm sure a lot of good players already on the roster. But at the end of the day, the team came up short of its goals this year. They did. I, I mean, it was an expectation for me for the Ducks to get to the Pac-12 championship game. And they were right there. They were right there in position to do it, and they did not. And what Lanning is clearly trying to do here is say, okay, we're trying to fully implement our vision. We're not trying to you know, take the keys from somebody else and then just keep driving the car. We want to go get our own car. We, we want to go to the dealer, negotiate our own price, and then say, this is what we want to drive off the lot with. And there are some really, really good pieces in there. I mean, really good ones. How many of them will be instant impact guys? It's kind of a crapshoot. I, I mean, I can speculate from now until the end of time on all that sort of stuff. But at the end of the day, you don't really know. We've got half an idea. We don't have a full idea, which is why uh, we wait and see. Speaking of waiting, just so you are all aware, so you don't come hounding me in my direct messages on Monday morning, there will be no show on Monday. There will be no show on Tuesday. There should be a show on Wednesday, day of the al- or of the of the holiday bowl. I will be down in Disneyland. I will be with my family, taking some a couple days off. Trust me, I'll have the itch to get back on the shows as soon as I stop doing them at a time when I normally would, but fear not for they will return. Unfortunately, every holiday season driving impaired returns. And that's not a good thing because did you know that driving high is considered driving under the influence? That's right. Driving under the influence of marijuana is against the law in every single state, all 48 of them in the union. That's being facetious, of course, because there are 53. Even in states where marijuana is legal, that means driving high to get a, will get you a DUI. And if you think law enforcement officers can't tell when you're driving high, you're flat out wrong. Your friends can tell. I can tell. Your coworkers can tell. Your parents can tell. Everyone can tell. So why would you think a law enforcement officer can't tell? He or she can. Driving under the influence of marijuana can slow your response time and how you perceive time and speed. So even if you think you're fine to drive when you're high, you're not. Play it safe. If you feel different, you drive different. And driving high is driving under the influence. So remember, drive high, get a DUI. This message paid for by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. I am still very optimistic about this recruiting class, despite Peyton Bowen not being there. It would have been a great extra kicker, right? And and I'd be lying if I said it didn't take away just like a sliver of the veneer of yesterday's high hopes. But overall, this is still a really, really 
great situation for Oregon to be in. Did I want to have Bowen? Yes. But got a couple other safeties on the class, got a couple guys on the roster. There'll be a lot of competition at that spot. Playing time will be readily available. And heck, if they like some of the corners they're bringing in or have on the roster and the development they could take, you could see Triquez Bridges sliding back to safety. I think that's entirely possible. He played much better as the year went on, but a safety who's got a lot of experience as a cover corner in situations, I don't think that's a bad thing. And that's the position he played coming out of high school. And it, it might be an option if none of the safeties pop or, or are ready to play. But remember, you've got Trajan Williams from last year's class, four-star safety out of Jefferson High School in Oregon. You've got Tyler Turner and Cody DeCambra coming in. J.J. Greenfield is, is still in there. Brian Addison. So a lot of different options. We don't know what's happening yet with Jamal Hill, who's you know definitely more of a, a strong safety kind of hybrid linebacker sort of guy. But could also move Jeffrey Bassa back to back to strong safety to play that you know star position, which I think he's more well suited for. He's a little undersized at the linebacker position, but there's still a lot of big gets. And the biggest one is Mateo. The, the biggest one is Mateo Uyunglele, and he he represents a couple of things. Number one, massive recruiting potential because Oregon's results on the field this year were good, but not great. And the staff is in year one. The, right, This is still year one for them. They haven't finished this recruiting cycle yet. And they've coached one season still with a bowl game left. So when you think about what it means for the potential going forward, it has to make you optimistic. Because this is a guy who was trending towards other schools, and he ends up committing to the Ducks. And he's a big, big-time player. Second highest-rated player in the class behind Jurion Dickey who did sign his national letter of intent, by the way, for those of you who didn't know, he was kind of, I don't know. I don't know what he was doing. He was kind of toying around. Like I got an announcement and there was nothing. And then I got another announcement. And it was kind of nothing. And then he signed. I don't know. Jerry on Dickey is coming to be a duck, which is a really, really good thing. And I'll, uh, I'll, I'll get to that in, in just a moment too. So with Mateo, it represents a lot of recruiting upside, specifically on the side of the ball, that we've seen Oregon, I don't want to say struggle to bring in high-level impact players on that side of the ball, but certainly more so in the offense for the last couple of seasons. I, I mean, Noah Sewell is kind of the last big re recruit for the last few years, right, other than Kayvon Thibodeau, who's really been an impact player on the field. They've had a lot of good players. But have they brought in those high-impact, game-changing guys? Noah Sewell is that. Kayvon Thibodeau is that. Christian Gonzalez is that. But he was you know, a one-and-done via the portal. And these are the sorts of players that, yes, even in the transfer portal era, you need to continue to bring in at the high school level. you, you got to have the guys on the roster who can come and make immediate impact and be at least three-year players. And Justin Flo had the potential to be that, got derailed by injuries. Yep, that's a bummer. But it doesn't mean I want to stop going after that caliber of player. Because if you want to win conference championships, plural, if you want to get to college football playoff, get back to the national championship game, you got to have those sorts of bodies. You, you got to have those sorts of bodies and keep going after them. They're not going to have a 100% hit rate. Doesn't mean you stop chasing them. So I think the recruiting potential is there. In the short term, the other side the, uh, of the coin, which is good for the decks, is Mateo comes in at a position of need. I, I mean, how many times this year did we say, man, the Oregon pass rush wasn't very good. And Brandon Dorless is a really good player. Would love to have him back. Gosh, Dorless and Mateo on the same defensive line. A couple of dudes right there. But Dorless was the only consistent dude. And even he faded a couple moments, right? Not a Thibodeau caliber player, but a very good, very disruptive player in both the run and passing game. Mateo has the potential to be the sort of guy that comes in and starts to help your defense right away, much like Kayvon Thibodeau did. Oregon's defense was good in 2018, took a step forward in 2019. Now, they had a guy who I think is an elite defensive play caller in Andy Avalos, but they also had the personnel. And every time Oregon's had a great team or a very, very good team, 
Justin Herbert Rose Bowl team, Mario to playoff team. I think the 2010 national championship team was a, a little bit different. All the Chip Kelly teams were a little bit different. But what we've seen since then is when you reflect back on the rosters, you say, wow, that guy's playing in the NFL regularly. That guy's in the NFL. That guy's in the NFL. Think even back to the national championship season with, with Mariota. Go look at the roster and how many defensive guys ended up being big time players in the league. You had DeForest Buckner, Eric Armstead. High four and a five-star recruit. You talk about reaching their full potential, those guys did. Mateo can be that sort of player. And Kayvon Thibodeau, when he got to Oregon as a true freshman, and I don't think that Mateo is Kayvon Thibodeau. He, he plays the same position. They have the same number of players, but Thibodeau was different. I mean, watch that, that game against the, the commanders the other day. That, that dude is built different. But Mayo is in that same sort of mold where he comes in at the most important position on the field when you're talking about getting pressure on the quarterback. And he can make an instant impact. He, he can make an instant impact at, in an area where Oregon was just lacking this year. DJ Johnson and, and Mace Funa had their moments. You know, DJ had far more than Mace, I think, this year. But it wasn't enough. It wasn't enough, and you need guys like this who can come in and and start to fill that immediate need. I would say wide receiver is an immediate need, but not as much as on the defensive line. But still, wide receiver up there in terms of like, eh, got a couple questions next year. So it's big that we got Jerry on Dickey signed. And and John Garcia, our recruiting insider here at the Locked On Network, had talked about this several times coming here, coming on the show. If Jurion had not signed today, the likelihood, or the other day, the likelihood that he could have flipped to another school because he, you know, was taking calls, seeing where the interest was, gauging all that, all that sort of stuff, was only going to go up. So I think it's really, really big that Oregon got him, and, and that's the highest rated recruit in the class, and everything about he, he is such a total package wide receiver. Like put him with Troy Franklin out there and Chris Hudson. That's as dynamic of a wide receiver trio as you've got in the Pac-12. It really, really is. He can be that sort of player and he does so many great things and should be, I think, the most, he and Mateo are close, most instant impact guys for this true freshman class coming in in 2023 Jurion is certainly up there. Mateo's obviously up there. I don't know what sort of player Kenyon Sadiq can be, whether he plays more wide receiver, tight end, hybrid, a little bit of both. I don't know. But, you know, T. Ferg is still going to be the number one tight end. I mean, he's a stud. He's just, he's fantastic. He makes him in that receiving core really, really good. I like Patrick Herbert as well. But it could have gotten dicey, and we need playmakers at wide receiver. Because remember with Will? Will Stein, I, I think he's going to bring a little bit more four wide receiver sets where they go two by two. Now they'll put Ferguson in the slot frequently because he can do that. And he, like Kenny and Sadiq, played a lot of wide receiver in high school. They both have that athletic build. I think Sadiq's a little closer to a wide receiver than, than Ferguson is. But if you tried to go four wide right now, you know, going into, going into the Holiday Bowl, for instance, right? Let's just say Chase Cota didn't play because he won't be on the roster next year. I mean, he, he will, by all accounts, play in the Holiday Bowl because it'll be his last college football game. But you'd have Franklin, you'd have Hudson, probably Josh Delgado or Isaiah Bravard or Isaiah Crocker, one of the, one of the two. And then I guess Kyler Casper, who's barely played. Maybe he gets an opportunity. I think there are a lot of guys to watch for in uh, in the Holiday Bowl. But – I, I really think that addition of Jerry on Dickey is pretty monumental and, and has the potential to have an even b bigger impact than Mateo. Cause Mateo is a highly sought after recruit, but cave on Thibodeau was more so. And Thibodeau's impact was felt more and more as the season went on early in the year. He was a little bit more of a pass rush specialist, you know, adjusting to the college game. It wasn't, you know, first series. He makes an impact, right? First series of the season. It played out that way more and more as the year went on. 
and I think Mateo will, will certainly have that adjustment at some level as well. But Jurion, that's plug and play. Like, look at him the way you look at Treshawn Holden, who I definitely left out of that receiver conversation going into next year uh, just a moment ago. Look at Treshawn Holden and say, well, no questions about him. That's the sort of recruit Jurion Dickey is. They're, I, 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 don't, I will be pretty surprised if he's not playing right away even more than Mateo, though I, I expect both to be impact guys as as true freshmen. Um, I'll save uh, what to watch for in the Holiday Bowl for for Wednesday show, so you guys can uh, wake up and and listen to it. We won't be seeing Noah Sewell, so that's certainly something to watch. Who fills in a linebacker? Who plays well? I, I think there's a lot of interesting stuff there. Also, just generally speaking, winning ten games, yeah, it looks really good. It's good for your program. It's 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 good reputationally. I like winning games. I'd like to end on a high note, especially with Bo Nix coming back. I'll save all that for uh, for for Wednesday show. And I know you and I both will have to survive a little without uh, locked on ducks for a few days, but such is the case in the holidays. And you know, it will be made on a personal level a little bit easier being in Disneyland. Just a little, just a little. Um, last thing, close with a question from my guy Nick P on YouTube. If you ever want a question answer here on the show, Twitter, YouTube comments, really easy to get in touch with me. So. Question for you, that being me. Last year, we saw a couple of players pull their names from the portal. Do you think any Ducks in the portal this year will pull back and return? If so, who? I think the answer to this question is a firm no. I do not expect anyone who has entered the portal at this point to be recruited back. Last year, we saw it happen with Sean Dollars, with Seven McGee, who have since you know returned to uh, or since returned to the portal and left the program. I I don't expect that because, number one, what I talked about to lead today's show with, the volume of players that they're bringing in, I think represents them wanting to put their own players in place who they think most suit their system and most fit what they want to do and what they're looking for in terms of their athletic profile. Doesn't mean the other guys aren't good players. It just means that Coaches want guys that they know, that they can trust, that they looked at and said, yeah, I want that guy. He can do this, and this is how he fits in, and that sort of stuff. So I think that's the first reason. And the second reason is last year, you know, I, I think landing with, with the unknown with regards to playing time, he had that pitch available to him. But after you had a season in which those guys didn't play as much as they're capable of, potentially or where they thought they were capable of and I, and I think some guys you know could have done more like I loved what the running backs did this year yeah he you could have given the ball to Sean Dollars more he was really really good but they just said no nope, we like Irving we like Whittington and that's what a lot of this is right it's not the Sean Dollars or Byron Cardwell or Seven McGee are not good capable players it's they just feel that there's a better option over here and there's a lot of talent in the country and that that's kind of what you know we're seeing here on national signing day and everything so um, I don't expect that because they can't, the coaching staff go to these guys and say, Hey, I know you're concerned about playing time, but we feel like you're going to be able to do this and just give us a chance to do this, that, and the other thing they could do that last year because they didn't coach the game. They hadn't put players on the field. They hadn't determ determ determined playing time or anything of the sorts. So I think all the guys that are in the portal will, will be leaving the program and that's, that's okay because Oregon's bringing in a lot of talent, as we saw on National Signing Day. I will be back here in your feeds on YouTube or wherever you listen to the show on Wednesday. Thank you so much. Happy holidays. Merry Christmas, everybody. Appreciate everyone listening. Have a wonderful rest of your day, and go Ducks.